All right, please take your Bibles once again and turn to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. So it's a, it's a rather long chapter. And I've decided to call, I mean, if you, if you read this chapter, it's a really sad story. It's really about the family of Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau. And um, just how deceptive they were toward one another. I and mean, it's such a sad story. You know, this is, this is supposed to be a godly family. It is a godly family. It is the family by which God has passed down the promises of, of Abraham. The great promise of Jesus Christ coming into this world would come through their loins, would come through their lineage. And we see, you know, th- th- this is why the Bible is not written by men. All right. I mean, if, if men were writing stories about themselves, and, and they're not going to give you the bad news. They're not going to tell you how wicked and how deceptive they were, right? I mean, this is, the Bible is the Word of God. You know, the Bible t- shows us the wickedness of man. It shows us the failure of man, and then it just confirms for us the faithfulness of God, that God is merciful, that He's long-suffering, you know, that He's willing to give us time, that He's willing to work with us even though we have a sinful nature. And as I read about these stories of the patriarchs in the past, yes, they had great successes, but they also had great failings. And I'm just reminded about the great God that I serve, and I'm thankful for that because I know I make a lot of mistakes. If you're honest, you make a lot of mistakes. If you're honest, you fail a lot of times. But thank God you've got the same God of the Bible. You've got the same God of Isaac who's willing to be merciful with you, who's willing to still work with you even when, when, when there is deception in the family. Deception. And so I decided to call the title for this morning uh, Deception. Deception. Let's start with with verse number 1 there, Genesis 27, verse 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. Now you may recall in the previous chapter, the Bible tells us that, or or sorry, the previous two chapters, that uh, Esau was the favored son of Isaac. And his twin brother, uh, Jacob, was the favored son of his mother, Rebecca. And I told you how favoritism is going to cause a lot of problems in your family. You start favoring one child over another, fathers, maybe one child, mothers, another child. You know, it's going to cause problems. And we start seeing this deception here in this family. Okay? And the story goes that basically Jacob feels like he's going to pass away. In fact, he lives many more years after this. But but he he believes he's going to pass away. So he wants to pass on the blessing, the promises of God unto the eldest Esau. Okay? And so that's why he calls Esau in this story. The Bible tells us here that his eyes were dim. He could barely see. In fact, it says that he could not see there in verse number one. And so Isaac is in a position to be deceived by his family. Okay, is he, you see, he, he will be deceived by his family. He gets deceived by his son, by, by his son Isaac. He gets deceived by his, his wife, Rebecca, in this story. But the first thing I want you to notice is I want to just cover this topic of deception. Okay, and we need to make sure that we're not people that are striving to deceive. We'll look at this later on. But we also need to make sure that we're a people, we're a church that's not being deceived by others. That we're aware that this world is full of people that are trying to deceive us. There could be people that desire to stand behind the pulpit and deceive you with false doctrine. Okay? And the first thing I want you to realize here in verse number one, the reason why it's easy to be deceived is because your eyes can be dim. You might be in a position where your eyes are blinded. In order for you not to be deceived, the first thing you need to understand is I need to make sure that I can see clearly. And here in this story, Isaac was blinded. He could not see properly. Please keep your finger there and go to Mark chapter 8. Keep your finger there in in Genesis 27 and go to Mark chapter 8. And just for the sake of our visitor, uh, just so you're aware, on on Sunday mornings, we go chapter by chapter through the Bible. We've been going through the book of Genesis. We're now up to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis 27. While you're turning to Mark 8, I'm going to read to you from Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Again, we've gone through the seven churches in the book of Revelation, but to the church of, of the Laodiceans, God says in verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have no need of nothing, and knowest, knowest uh, not thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind, the Bible says, 
Jesus says to the Laodicean church that they are blind, okay, and naked. And then he says in verse number 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And then he says this, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So you see, the church in the, of the Laodiceans got to a point, hey, they were a great church, they were a candlestick shining for Jesus Christ, but they got to a point as a church where Jesus says they are blind, they cannot see. And we need to be careful as a church that we don't become like the Laodiceans, that we don't become like Isaac, where our eyes are dim, where we start becoming blind, you know, and that we go to Jesus Christ and we ask Him for the solution. We ask Him for the eyes of, so we can see, so we can see clearly. You say, what is that solution? It is the Word of God. You know, the more you know the Word of God, the more you will see, you know. J Jesus Christ come into, to, he, made, he made many of the blind to see, didn't He? Well, that's what He wants to do for us. You know, salvation can be, can be seen in this light, where you were once blind to the gospel, once you know the gospel, once you believe on Jesus Christ, now you can see. But it's also applicable to our Christian life. It's also applicable to our Christian life. Have a look at uh, Mark chapter 8, please. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Speaking of Jesus Christ here, it says, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring him a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. Now, before I keep reading, when we read about Jesus Christ healing the blind men in the Bible, many times he heals them completely. As soon as he touches them, as soon as he speaks to them, whatever, they can see. But in this story, there's actually a process. Look at verse number 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and, be, and said, I see men as trees walking. So here we have the blind man. Jesus makes an attempt to heal him. He asks him, can you see? And he can't see very well. He goes, I, I see men, but they look like trees walking. You know, he hasn't received a full healing of his eyes. He still can't see clearly just yet. So what does Jesus do? Verse number 25. After that, he put his hand again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. I'm glad we have this story in the Bible. I'm glad we have this story. You see, in order for us to see clearly, it can take time. It could be a process. Now, I'm not talking about salvation as a process. Once you understand, you believe the gospel, once you've put your full faith on Christ, you're born again into the family. You know, you're saved, okay? But what can happen? And we, we, <laughs> this happens a, a lot, right? New believers, they, they know the gospel, they've learned many spiritual truths maybe, they start learning the Bible, they, they think they can see clearly. They think now they can correct everybody. They think now they can become pastors. They think now they can just preach and, and they, they know all the truths. Many times, all they can see is men walking as trees. You see, growing as a Christian, maturing, knowing the Bible requires work, requires a process, requires you to study, read, memorize, meditate on the Word of God. That's what's required from you. The Bible says in Psalm 119 verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How do we see clearly as we mature as Christians? We need the word of God. We need the lamp of God unto our, our feet so we can walk clearly. All right? Uh, don't expect, and I'm sure you can probably think of people. I, can, I certainly can. Don't expect, you know, you've been saved a year. You've been saved for two years. Oh, I'm, I know all the Bible now. I've got all the doctrines worked out. Look, you, you can't see clearly. You need, you need the Word of God to continue shining for you, okay? I mean, this is why you need to be careful of not being deceived. You need the Word of God. You need to test everything you hear behind the pulpit by every preacher in accordance to God's Word. Now, with the Laodicean church, they once could see. They once were a great church, but they had gotten to a point where they became blinded, Right? And as they became blinded, Jesus says, look, I want you to fix this up because they're going to be deceived. No, they're already deceived. 
You know, but that would con continue down the, 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 the deception and not see clearly. And so while a good church can become blind, the reverse is also true when you don't know much about the Bible. When you're, when you're a babe in Christ, you start kind of not being able to see. You can see somewhat. You start to, it starts to clarify for you, but you don't have the complete truth and you need uh, to go from being blind to being able to see. So I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful that Jesus Christ has given us this story in Mark chapter 8, if you've ever wondered, why did this man get healed completely? It's so we can take a spiritual truth from it and understand it takes time to be able to see clearly. It takes time and effort to know the Word of God, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, be effective for Him and not to be deceived. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 6, speaking about the qualifications of a pastor or even just any teacher, any preacher, not a novice, lest being filled up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. That's the problem with the novice. That's the problem with the guy that can't see properly. Is that it's easy for them to be filled up with pride. Filled up with, oh, look how much knowledge I have. Look, look, look at me. You know, I, I can correct everybody's life. I can correct everybody around me. They become filled with pride and they fall into the condemnation. The same damnation of the devil. The devil was filled up with pride and he brought him low. Christians can be filled up with pride and it will bring you low as well. The same condemnation, condemnation that fell upon the devil could fall upon you, you know, being taken down by God because you're filled up with pride, because you can't see, because you're deceived, okay? Um, and, and, you know, we need to be careful of false prophets. I, I mentioned that. Be careful of false prophets. I'll just read to you from Romans 16, 17. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have uh, learned, and avoid them. Look, how are you going to mark people that cause divisions and that are bringing in contrary doctrines? How are you going to mark them and avoid them if you can't see? You know, how are you going to do that? Well, here's what you do. You pick up the Bible. Every doctrine you believe, you should have a, a passage of Scripture that teaches that black and white, crystal clear, you know? When you learn doctrines, once you learn it, you've got to nail that doctrine in. You've got to then, I've got this doctrine, I have understand it, and you start building. But you've got to have clear scripture. You can't say, well, the Bible somewhere says this, or I heard this preacher say that, or somewhere in the Bible it says, no, it's not good enough. You learn doctrine, you learn where it is, you write it down, you put it on your phone, you do whatever you need to do to, to, to know, hey, if I ever get any challenges, I don't know about this doctrine, you go back to those verses, refresh your memory, nail in those doctrines. Otherwise, you will be deceived like Isaac was deceived. The Bible keeps going. It says in verse number 18, For they that are such, those that we need to mark and avoid, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words of fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. If you've not read your Bible cover to cover, you're a simple person, okay? You're still simple-minded. You might feel you know a lot about the Bible. You may feel you know a lot of doctrine. If you've not read it cover to cover, God's book. People have died for that book. So you can have it in your hands. And you haven't read it? Give me a break. You know, you're still simple. Now look, that's fine. That's fine. But get to a point where you've read it cover to cover. You know, I'm not saying that, you, you know, we all start somewhere where we haven't read the Bible cover to cover. Then get to the point where you've read it cover to cover. And once you've read it once, guess what you do next time? You read it again. You get through it two times. You get it through three times. You, you, know, can, you know, so on and so forth. You know, you, you need to know what the Word of God says so you're not deceived by the false teachers. I haven't got time to go through this, but if you want to do some study during the week, 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 in the book of Jude will tell you what false prophets are like so you're not deceived. Those two chapters are the main chapters that tell us all about the nature of the false prophet. Now, the Bible tells us it has many other places that teach us these things, but those are the two key passages you need to look at. And uh, you need to do this because, you know, you, you might not always be at New Life Baptist Church. You might be in different churches. You may have different preachers, and you need to measure up those preachers. You need to measure up those pastors with the list of the false prophets so you can point out when you've got a false prophet, prophet behind the pulpit. Okay, now I believe. Go check it out. I don't. I, I believe strongly that I do not measure up to a false prophet at all. 
all right? I don't believe I have any of those qualities in me, um, and I'm sure you wouldn't be in this church for two years if you thought that, okay? Nevertheless, I'm not a false prophet, but does that mean I can't make mistakes behind the pulpit? Even unintentionally, think about that. I want you to be careful as a church, all right? We've been here for two years. I appreciate you guys. I'm sure you appreciate me. I know you appreciate me, and I know I appreciate you guys. But you can't get comfortable. You can't just sit behind the pulpit. Well, Pastor Kevin's proven himself for the last two years. You know, we can see that, you know, he's, he's doctrinally sound, and ah, I'm just going to lay back now in church, and I'll just take in whatever's being taught there behind the pulpit. Wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. You know, you, you've got to test everything with the Word of God. I might not be a false prophet, but this is what I am. You know, this is what I am. I'm, human, I'm a human being. Okay, I can make mistakes. I can. Now, I'm not trying to. I don't purposely get behind this pulpit trying to make an error, trying to deceive you, but it can happen. I could make a mistake, and you could walk away from church saying, being, de- being deceived by some false teaching. Okay? There are good men behind pulpits. There are good pastors out there, but that doesn't stop them from having false teaching. I, I would say to you, every pastor, every pastor, every good pastor has false teaching somewhere in their list of doctrines. Okay? And again, it's not intentional. It's just that we're human beings. We're looking at this chapter, godly people, godly family. God is using his family. They make some major mistakes and they get deceived as well. Okay? If the patriarchs that God is using mightily can be deceived, we all can be deceived. Okay? But this is the warning. This is what we need to be ready for. Prepare ourselves. You know, reduce the amount of deception that might come into our lives. Anyway, let's go back to Genesis 27, verse number 2. Genesis 27, verse 2. And he said, this is Isaac, Behold, I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons. Now remember, Esau was a hunter, okay? So take thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and make me some venison. And that's venison is, I said it, it's deer, hunting deer. I had a quick fact check, and it, it usually is. It's usually the first uh, uh, definition of it. But it can be other wild game out there, okay? So um, he wants uh, uh, Esau to go out and, and hunt him some fresh meat. Verse number four. And make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Now, Rebekah is the wife of Isaac. Remember this? Verse number five. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake unto Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob his son. Now, remember, Jacob is the favored son of Rebekah. Okay, uh, Isaac just finished telling Esau that he wants to bless Esau. He wants to pass down the promises that have come to him from Abraham to Esau. And Rebekah, she wants to make sure the blessing falls on her favored son. So now she steps in and deceives her own husband. Okay, verse number six. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob his son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Now, think about this. She's asking her son, obey my voice. She's about to teach Jacob how to deceive his father. Think about this now, guys. Should he be listening to his mother here? No. She wants to deceive her husband. Jacob said, no, mom, that's not the right thing to do. Okay? But he goes along with it. He goes along with the deception. Verse number nine, go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth, and thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My brother's like that. My brother's a hairy man, and I'm the smooth man in the family. Anyway, we have this in the Bible. Verse number 12. My father peradventure will fill me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, not a blessing. So you can see here that Jacob is concerned about the deception that's going to be made, but at the end of the day, he goes along with it. Now, what I want you to do is please keep your finger there and go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We're talking about being deceived and, and over, making sure that you know, we prepare ourselves as best as we can with the Word of God to make sure we're not deceived 
But 1 John chapter 4 gives us some more information about deceivers, about deceivers. And 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible says here, Beloved, beloved, you know, John is saying to the believers, I love you. When he says beloved, he cares for the believers, he cares for the brethren. He says, believe not every spirit. Brethren, do you believe anyone that calls themselves Christians? Do you believe anyone that puts on a nice jacket and a nice tie, gets behind the pulpit? Believe not every spirit, the Bible says, but try the spirits, attest the spirits, whether they are of God. Because, why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You say, there's probably just a few false prophets out there. Many, many false prophets have gone into the world. Man, you read the Old Testament, usually the, 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 the false prophets are outnumbering the men of God. Many times the, old, the false prophets are just outnumbering them, you know, compared to the true prophets of God. Here, verse number two, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And, that the, and this is the spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Now, sometimes we preach about the tribulation, the end times. We speak about, about the beast and the Antichrist. There is already a spirit of Antichrist in this world. The false prophets are not people of God. They, they have another spirit, the spirit of the devil, the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, here in these days, here, and, and look, even today, you know, we have those that deny that Jesus is the Christ or that He came in the flesh, that the Messiah came in the flesh. And immediately our thoughts will turn to Judaism, right? They believe in a Messiah, they believe in the Christ, but they don't believe that Christ has yet come in the flesh. You know, they deny Christ as the Messiah, denying Christ as uh, Jesus as the Christ, okay? That is, that religion is the spirit of Antichrist. But that's not the only one. Keep reading verse number four. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome then, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now look at verse number five. They are of the world, speaking about the false prophets, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. This is how, another way you spot the false prophet. They are of the world, right? They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. Listen, the false prophet will come and preach you the prosperity gospel. They preach about the world, how much you can attain in this world, you know, making the riches, make, you know, you know uh, making a name for yourself in this world. They bring in the world's music into the church. They bring in the world's entertainment into the church. They bring in the world's programs into the church. They're all about this world. They're about the temporary life. They're about making money. That's how you spot a false prophet as well. Okay? They're not focused on eternal life. They're not focused on that because they're not even saved. They're false prophets. You say, man, but there's so many people in those churches. The rock bands, the dancing, you know, the, the whatever, the, the acting, the performances that go on. Those churches are full of people. How many of us are here? 35 maybe, all right? Uh, but those churches have thousands of people. Well, what did it say there in verse number five? At the end of it, and the world heareth them. Listen, their church is not made up of believers. It's made up of the world, okay? There's very few believers. There's very few that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Most of those people, I'm not saying all, but most of those people in those churches that make up those thousands, are not even saved. They're of the world. And the reason they're there is because they hear those that preach of the world. That's how you make a big church. And unfortunately, because Christians can be deceived, there are believers in those churches. There are true sons and daughters of God in those churches. I've met many of them, okay, that are in those churches. And they're there because they see the big church. They say, well, God must be blessing this church because it's big. They can't see. They've been blinded, like Isaac. They've been deceived. You know, they look at the big church and think, wow, God is blessed. No, it is a church made of the world. It is a church for the world. That's how you make sure, you know, you don't get deceived by certain preachers if they're focused on this world. Let's keep reading verse number six. 
We are, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Think about this. When we have people come to our church, again, they're not always in lockstep with what we believe, right? How do I as a pastor make a decision whether this is a deceiver, this is someone that's coming to try to hurt our church, or is this just someone that's learning, that's growing? Well, verse number five gives us the answer. Oh, sorry, verse number six. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. If someone comes with contrary doctrine, and I can share my faith, I can share our doctrine, the things we stand on, and they hear us, praise God. They're listening. They're trying to learn. They're trying to grow. They're not a deceiver, even if they're not in lockstep with us. But if they hear us not, if we, we stand on our doctrine, we, we explain the doctrine, they refuse it, they're against it, then they're not of God. They, 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 they've come to hurt our church. They've come to be a deceiver to our church. That's how we measure it, okay? It's not that just like someone walks in, they believe differently, oh, I must be a wicked person. No, okay, it's not at all. You know, if they're willing to listen, willing to grow, praise God, Let, you know, allow them in the church. But if they come in to fight the doctrines, trying to be contrary, trying to cause problems, that's a false teacher. That's someone that's coming to hurt us. The Bible says in Jeremiah 14, 14, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination of a thing of naught and the deceit of their hearts. There are many prophets, many people that name themselves Christians, that name Christ, that are out there prophesying lies. They've not been sent by God, he says. How do you know? Again, the measure is, the, is God's word. How do we know? They lie to you. They preach falsehoods. They f- preach false doctrines contrary to this book. They're a false prophet. Get out of that church if that's what's happening. Get out of that church. Back to Genesis 26, verse 13. Genesis 26, verse 13. Better hurry up. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse. Remember, Jacob was concerned that he'd be cursed because he's trying to deceive his father. The mother says, let that curse be upon me, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat, such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her elder son Esau, which were, in her, sorry, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. So Jacob puts on what? Esau's clothing okay, to deceive his father. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat of the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he, and he came to his father. So it's not just Esau's clothing, but she gets the, 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 the hair of the animals and puts them on Jacob's arms and his hands. So when the father touches him, he sees that he's a hairy man. I mean, what a deception. What does this remind you of? Remember now, look, uh, J- Jacob is a godly man, he's saved, okay? But of course, we take the spiritual lessons here. What does this remind you of? This re- it merely reminds me of the wolves in sheep's clothing, okay? What do they put on? Hey, they look wonderful on the outside, okay? They, they look like righteous ministers of God on the outside. Sometimes it takes time to realize that man is a false prophet. That man is a wolf because the wolf, the false prophet, will at, be- at the beginning look like a sheep. And this is, a, this is what we see here, right? Jacob wants to look like Esau so he can receive the blessing from his father, Isaac, deceive his father. I mean, they're doing wrong. Don't, don't, look, don't read this and think they're doing right. They're doing wrong as a family. Very deceptive. <clears throat> and Jacob, um, sorry, verse number 18, and he, and he came to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau thy firstborn. Just bold face lie. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And let me stop there for a moment, because Jacob listened to the advice of his mother, okay? And children, there can be times, I'm not saying there will be times, I'm saying that it can happen, especially if you grow up in an ungodly, unfaithful, non-Christian family, okay? that your parents may ask you to do deceptive things. They might, they might ask you to lie and do untruths. They might ask you to sin. 
employees, your employer might ask you to do deceptive things, might ask you to lie, to do sinful things, okay? Our government, you know, might ask us to lie, to be deceptive, to do ungodly things, to do sins. What do we do when we're being asked by those in authority to do wrong things? Do we listen to them? The Bible says in Acts 5.29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Who do we obey, guys? We obey God rather than men. All right? You, you put God's commandments first, regardless of the pressures that have been put upon you. Okay? Now, Jacob thinks he's going to miss out on the blessing. That's why they're being deceptive. All right? You might be forced to lie or, just, or feel you need to lie or commit some sin because you feel like you're going to miss out on something. Don't worry about it. You obey God. You do what's right. God knows what's going on. God is seeing what's going on. He'll settle things. He'll make sure things are right. Psalm 27 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. There are many nations today that trust in their armies, that trust in their firepower, you know, their, 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 their gunships and their, 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 their airplanes, their armies, their navy. You know, they, they trust in their power. They think they're a powerhouse. I'd rather remember the name of the Lord our God because God can wipe them out in an instant. In fact, God will. Jesus Christ, when he comes back, will wipe out the, these armies of the Antichrist just by speaking the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. I mean, I mean, you know, no, no firepower on this earth can, can match the power of God. Psalm 118 verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Even people in authority, even in power of money, it's still better to trust God than those people that have power and authority on this earth. And Romans 13 verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So look, if you're under the authority, yes, obey them. But you need to be subject to the higher powers. What's higher than the government? What's higher than your parents? What's higher than your employers? What's higher than your church pastor? God. You put God first. You be subject to Him. You make sure that you do what He's commanded to you, even if that means you have to go against the authorities that are under God. You be subject to the higher powers. Rebecca and Jacob should have been subject to the higher power, the Lord God. Verse number 20. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Oh, what a lie. I mean, not only are they being deceptive, this is what deceivers do. Oh, God told me. God told me. You know, I have a situation in Sydney. One man full of flattery. Oh, God's using this church. You know, God's using you. This is going to be a massive church full of flattery. God, God's working you guys. Now, he's been kicked out of church for being a railer. Okay? Hey, I thought God told you to love this church. I thought God wanted you in this church. And now you're turning the hearts of people against one another in the church. That's what deceivers too, do. That's how they are. They say, uh, talk about God. Oh, God's done this. God's told me this. God told me to be in this church. Next week, they're out of church. Man, you know, that's what's going on here with Jacob. You know, you say this is, this is God's decision. No, it's, it's, a, it's the wickedness of your own heart. Oh, man, you bring God into your deception. How despicable. I lost my place. What am I up to, guys? Sorry, 21? Yeah, 21. <clears throat> and Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. So you see, Jacob has some questions. He's, I'm not sure if this is Esau, all right? But he's blind. He's been blind that he can't see. Verse number 22, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, the voice, of Jacob's, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, and his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Thou art my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, and my soul shall bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of the raiment, and blessed him, and said... So before I keep reading, verse number 27. 
He's got questions. Again, are you really my son? He says, yep, I am. He feels his hands, they're hairy. He says, come close so I can kiss you. And he does it so he can see, you know, what kind of clothing are you wearing? How do you smell? And because he's wearing Esau's clothes, he smells like Esau, you know, like a wild hunter out there in the field, you know. And uh, there's instinct in Isaac. You can see some instincts there, some gut, a gut feeling. This is, things aren't right. Sometimes you need to listen to your gut feeling. You need to listen to your instincts. I'm not very good at this. I don't think men are very good at this, I think. I think women are generally pretty good at this. I mean, there's plenty of times where my, my, my wife has said, you know, that person's a bit odd, that person's a bit, I'm like, honey, come on. You know, you know why do you have to be that way? Next thing you find out, yeah, they are odd. <laughs> next, thing, next thing you find out, they're a deceiver. Next thing you find out, they're, you know, in wickedness or, or whatever. It's happened many times. I'm sure there are husbands here that can say the same thing. You know, your, your wives have given you a tip off about something. You've been like, ah, come on, honey. And it's actually been true. <laughs> All right. I think, I think ladies generally are sort of more in touch with the instincts in this area. Okay. But it doesn't mean men can't. You know, obviously we see Isaac here. He has some instincts. And sometimes you, at the end of the day, he still is deceived. He gives into the deception. He tries to find out the truth, but he's deceived all the way through. Again, why? Because he's blinded. Okay. And we need to be careful. Okay. You know, you might have the gut instincts. This doesn't seem right. This person seems wrong. This pastor seems like, I don't know about this guy. You know, and you might just try things. And at the end of the day, you know, you've, you've given it some effort. You know, you need to listen to your instincts. You know, if you've got some concerns, maybe you need to bring it to other people. Maybe you just need to take it to God, you know, and find out the truth and see, you know, if there are other situations. Uh, you know, Isaac maybe could have done further research. But at the end of the day, he accepted what he, what he, what he had, uh, what, he, what, he, what he smelt, what he felt, and uh, was deceived, was deceived. And uh, that's, how, that's how strong deception can be. You know, once you've been deceived, it's actually very hard for someone to admit they've been deceived. That's something else I've noticed. You know, when someone believes a false doctrine, and they've been teaching it for years, and they get to a point where they, they even think this could be wrong, it's very hard for them to let go of it. Very hard. Once you're deceived, it's very, it's, it's hard. What's the saying? I think it's easy to be deceived and to admit you've been deceived. Something along those lines. There is a saying like that. I, I believe that's very, very true. Uh, let's keep reading the verse number 27. And, and uh, at the end of it, it says, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed him. Verse 28. Therefore God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. So you can see it's the same promises, the same blessings that God gave to Abraham, to Isaac. He is now given this to what he believes is Esau, but it's actually Jacob. Verse number 30, And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made the end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was uh, yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from the hunting. Now, the next point that I want to just bring up here before we keep reading, uh, there is a saying that, go, that says, the ends does not justify the means. Have you guys heard that one before? The ends does not justify the means. What that means is you might, be, uh, you might have a goal, you might have a set goal, which is righteous, which is good, but you decide to take a wicked path to get there. You, know, you may decide to deceive people to get to that target quicker you know um give you one example that you, many of you are aware of let's say somebody wants to be ordained as a pastor but they believe wicked heresy okay now the mean you know the the the, uh, the means is is probably good being a pastor it's a good work the bible says okay but they hide these things they hide these these uh false doctrines they become deceptive about it you know, they're trying to reach the means, but, you know, what's the saying again? The, oh, the end, sorry, no, the end is good, sorry, the end is good, but the mean by which they're trying to get to that end, they're being deceptive about it. We need to be careful about that because, again, the end might be good. You might say, well, I need to get there. That's a righteous thing, but the way you go about it can be very ungodly, can be very wicked. And this is what we're seeing here because it is Jacob that was meant to be blessed by Isaac, okay, and mum and, and son were concerned it's not going to happen, so let's deceive dad and make sure it's going to happen, 
Listen, God already promised to Rebekah that Isaac would be the one. Take your Bibles and go to Genesis 25. Keep your finger there in 27, but go to Genesis 25, verse 22. Let's just remind ourselves. Genesis 25, verse 22. We cannot commit theft. We cannot lie. We cannot deceive for the cause of Christ. There's no such thing. You do things right according to God's ways. Genesis 25, 22. Genesis 25, 22. And the children struggled together within her. This is within Rebecca when she was pregnant. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire to who? Of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. Look at this. And the elder shall serve the younger. God already said Jacob will be the one in charge. Jacob will be the one where the promises are going to be given. This was already promised by God. There's no need to be deceptive about it. Okay? Even when you think it's not going to happen, God's going to step in. You either allow God to step in and do what he says, or you try to step in and be deceptive about it. They didn't wait. They could have been faithful. God would have sorted it out. Jacob would have been blessed, no matter what, if they just trusted in the Lord. The Lord already said what's going to happen. Now, we don't know what might have happened. We don't get the story because they became deceptive. They found some other method. I've heard people preach, oh, you know, God was, was okay with the deception because it was Jacob that needed to be blessed. No. That's not right. They, they deceived. They, 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 you know, they were deceptive. They could have just waited on the Lord. The Lord would have made sure it was going to happen. I'll read to you from Romans 9, 6, just quickly. I'll just read it to you. Not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Listen, the word of God has an effect. We can't say that it has no effect. Once it promises, it's going to happen. All right? Verse number seven, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So we see Isaac, yeah, the blind father. That is, verse number eight, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Verse number uh, nine, for this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. God gives a promise. Once God promises, just rest in it. It's going to happen. All right? Verse number 11. Oh, sorry, verse number 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, verse number 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Rebecca knew what God had said to her. Rebecca knew that Jacob would be the one that would bring in that promised seed into this world. She was doing what she thought was right, right? She saw the end, and the end is Jacob needs to be blessed. But the means by which she journeyed was deception, was wrong. She took it into her own hands. Listen to me. When God makes a promise... God's going to take care of it. If you have prayer requests, you need God to step in in your lives. You let God do it then. If you are unable to do it righteously, in the right way, you let God deal with it. Otherwise, you're going to be tempted to be, do things ungodly in ungodly ways, to do things contrary to his word, to fulfill that request you need. Listen, if you can't do it in a godly manner, leave it to God to take care of. Leave it to God. God would have taken care of this. I don't know how, but God says he would have because he made the promise. God would have taken care of it. They went and became deceptive and found their own ways. Let's go to verse number 31, please, in Genesis uh, 27, verse 31. I'll try to speed up now, guys. Verse number 31. And, and he, that being Esau, also made savory meat and brought it to his father and said unto his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison, venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. 
And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came in with subtlety and have taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he have supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Remember that? He says he took away my birthright. He gave it away. He despised the birthright, the Bible says. All right? But anyway. And behold, now he have taken away my blessing. And he said, listen, the blessing came with the birthright. Those things came together. All right? Esau gave it away. He also gave away the blessing. This is why God, through his eyes, knew which of these sons wanted the blessing. Which of these sons wanted the birthright? Which of these sons was caring about the promise of God to bring Jesus into this world? It was Jacob. And so Jacob got the promise. Okay? It would have happened even without the deception. Verse number 37. Oh, sorry, verse number 36. And he said, Is he not rightly named? Oh, sorry, I did read that. He's taken away my blessing, and he said, Hast thou not received a blessing for me? Verse number 37. And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord. And all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? He said, Look, I've already blessed him. It's too late. Verse number 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shall serve thy brother. Now again, remember, it's Eden, the, the descendants of Esau, that would serve eventually Israel. Okay? They would live on the land of Canaan under the, under the Israelites, and they would pay taxes. They would pay tribute in order for them to, be able to live on the land. And that's what the Father's prophesying of here. Okay? That um, thou shalt serve thy brother. That's the nations that would come out of these two. And shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke of from, sorry, break his yoke from off thy neck. I believe I was looking into this a little bit. If you're curious, you might want to write down 2 Kings 8.20. 2 Kings 8.20. We see that Edom has a, uh, you know, stops paying taxes and they rebel against Israel. So this might be the fulfillment of what is being spoken of here in verse number 40. Anyway, verse number 41. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And this is what happens with, with deception, guys. You deserve your, deceive your family. You deceive people in church. What's going to happen? You're going to cause people to hate you. You're going to cause your brethren to hate you because of your deception. It doesn't end well. It never ends well, being a deceiver. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father were are at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. Now, thankfully... Um, uh, Jacob lives, uh, sorry, Isaac lives for many, many more years. I think, I could be wrong, but at least 20 years, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll have to fact check that a little bit later. So it says, look, once my father dies, I'm going to go and kill my brother. You know, it's, it's almost like that Cain attitude, you know, killing uh, Abel there. And uh, verse number 42, and these words of Esau, her, el um, her eldest son were told to Rebekah. So Rebekah hears about Esau wanting to kill his brother. And again, remember, Jacob is Rebekah's favorite. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, that he forget that which thou hast done to him, and then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Again, deception has consequences. Rebecca realizes the deception they've caused has angered Esau to the point of him making an oath to kill his brother Jacob, to kill her favored son, you know. And so she has to send Jacob away, send him away to save his life. And now she can't be with her favored son. You know, now she's paying the penalty. She's paying the cost of deception. She can't be with the son that she gets along with best. All right. Uh, yeah, deception has its consequences. Let's keep reading verse number 46. Verse number 46. Now, what's interesting about these two chapters uh, that we're reading now, 20, uh, 26 and also 25, they both end with a very similar story. Okay. 
Um, if you guys just go back to um, sorry guys, we're in Genesis 27, aren't we? We're in Genesis 27. Uh, Genesis 27 ends in a very similar way to Genesis 26. All right. If you guys just look back in Genesis 26, just the last verses there, verse number 34, Genesis 26, verse 34, it's talking about Esau here. It said, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a great grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. So we learned about Esau taking ungodly women from the land of Canaan to be his wife, to be their to his wives, and that this was a, a burden, a grief to his parents. But look at verse number 46 in, Genesis, in chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 46, the way this ends as well, it says, And Rebekah said, said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? And that's how it ends, okay? So we see, you know, even though uh, the time has progressed here, these wives that um, Esau has taken is just a grief to Rebecca. I mean, they're, they're having bad mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relations right now, okay? And she doesn't want uh, Jacob to take the same women to be his wife. He doesn't want, she doesn't want the, the women of the land of Canaan to be a wife to Jacob. And so just keep those two things in mind. The Bible gives us these, the, ends these two chapters with a very similar story because it, it keeps leading into the next chapter, the next chapter. Uh, so we'll get onto that next week. So uh, just, in, just in summary, guys, just very quickly, thank you for your patience. It's been a long chapter. Number one, be careful about being deceived. The only way you're going to save yourself from deception is to have, to be able to see clearly, to see clearly through the Word of God. Listen to your instincts as well. Husbands, listen to your wives when they have instincts. They're not always right, but very, very often they are right, okay, about their personal instincts. Listen to them as well. The second thing that I, the main key thing that I want to take away from this, guys, is that you need to trust in the Lord. Once the Lord has promised you something, God will make sure He meets it. Don't be deceptive with the way you live your lives, even if you have the, a righteous end to it. You know, the, 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 um, the end does not justify the means. We cannot be deceptive people. You start deceiving people. You start deceiving people in this church, like Esau, they're going to hate you. Okay, it's going to cause problems in this church. Be careful of deception. Let's pray.